Oops, I've got to back out. Sorry, I got to stop that for a second. Still trying to figure this all out. Okay, well, welcome to our uh, Lenten lunch today, um, the very last one of this Lenten season, a season of recovery. And if we could start out this morning, um, let us pray together. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you for these six weeks where we have uh, had the opportunity to prepare ourselves for the coming of Holy Week. We thank you that we have been given the gift of signs of spring, new life and renewal that comes with this time of year. We thank you, Lord, for those that have been able to be present during our Lenten lunches, but also we wanna thank you for the gift of this technology so that we can reach others who are not able to be here or who are, you know, wintering in other places. And Father, we just, your world is amazing to us and you offer us so much that we just take for granted. And, and uh, Lord, we just ask that you would bless us as we continue today in our service. We ask that you bless our community around us and all of those who give in service to your betterment of the world, for your healing of the world. Father, we thank you uh, for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. And as we begin to move from this season of uh, repentance and penance and restoration, may we uh, share together in the passion, death, and resurrection of your son as a reminder of just what he sacrificed for us and how great your love for us is. Bless us in this service, bless us as we go about our business, and Lord, above all, remember, help us to remember all of your faithful servants across this globe. This we pray, amen. Wow, okay, so let's see if I can do it from here. reading this morning comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 16 through 21. From now on therefore we regard no one from a human point of view even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ there is a new creation everything old has passed away See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is in Christ, 
God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. May the Lord add a blessing to the hearing of his scripture. At this time, let us join together in, um, I come to the garden, and for you that are with me here, it's on 398. I come to the garden alone, while the dew still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear the Son of God discloses and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. He speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling, but he bids me go through the voice of woe. His voice to me is calling, and he walks with me and he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. This time I'm going to uh, offer our Lenten message. As we come to the end of the season of Lent and we prepare to enter Holy Week, I'm reminded of this scripture from 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21. Throughout this Lenten season, we have had the opportunity to look at our brokenness, the ways that we have fallen short before God, the behaviors and thoughts that lead us into an unhealthy way of being, We've looked at many of Jesus's healing stories in the Bible and where our own lives, we seek emotional and spiritual and physical healing for ourselves and for our communities. We often think of the season of Lent as a time of wilderness and fasting, acts of penance and self-denial, self-flagellation even. All of these are to lead us closer to God, 
in preparation for receiving the gift of Easter. But I like to think of it as house cleaning. It's spring and a time of renewal and restoration. When I was a child, every spring, our house would get torn apart. Imagine you might be able to relate. Ceilings and walls got washed, windows got cleaned, closets and bureau door, drawers were cleaned out, curtains were washed and hung out in the fresh air. My parents might embark on some new paint or wallpaper or flooring project, depending on what room needed an upgrade the most. It was a time of upheaval and a need for patience, as it wasn't always fun. And yet, it was a time of anticipation and excitement for the end result. <clears throat> we are given that same opportunity during Lent, a time to clean house, our spiritual house. I want to share with you this short reading from a book titled Bread and Wine, Readings for Lent and Easter, which the reading today is called My Messy House, written by a well-known author, Kathleen Norris. My Messy House. When I'm working as an artist in residence at parochial schools, I like to read the Psalms out loud to inspire the students who are usually not aware that the snippets they sing at mass are among the greatest poems in the world. But I have found that when I have asked children to write their own Psalms, their poems often have an emotional directness that is similar to that of the biblical Psalter. They know what it's like to be small in a world designed for big people, to feel lost and abandoned. Children are frequently astonished to discover that the psalmist so freely express the more unacceptable emotions, sadness, and even anger, even anger at God. And that all of this is in the Bible that they hear read in church on Sunday morning. Children who are picked on by their big brothers and sisters can be remarkably adept when it comes to writing cursing psalms. And I believe that the writing process offers them a safe haven in which to work through their desires for vengeance in a healthy way. Once a little boy wrote a poem called The Monster Who Was Sorry. He began by admitting that he hates it when his father yells at him. His response in the poem is to throw his sister down the stairs and then to wreck his room and finally to wreck the whole town. The poem concludes, then I sit in my messy house and say to myself, I shouldn't have done all that. My messy house says it all with more honesty than most adults could have mustered. The boy made a metaphor for himself that admitted the depth of his rage and also gave him a way out. If that boy had been a novice in the fourth century monastic desert, his elders might have told him that he was well on the way toward repentance, not such a monster after all, but only human. If the house is messy, they might have said, why not clean it up? Why not make it into a place where God might also wish to dwell? I found this very short reading very compelling about uh, how messy our house can be and whether we act or, or don't act upon that messiness really is partially dependent upon our relationship with God and our belief that we're accepted by God. Writing is an act of healing. It helps us to express ourselves on paper, what we perhaps would never dream of saying in words. Journaling is often recommended by support groups and therapists as a way of cleaning house sorting out the trash from the treasures, the falsehoods from the truth, 
renaming and claiming those vulnerable places in our lives. All of these acts of healing that we have been exploring this Lenten season are meant to help us clean house, a pathway of self-reflection and reconciliation as we move into the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ and what that means to us as followers of Jesus. I don't know if writing is a venue that you use for healing. I know I often do. I write letters to people and never send them. Um, it helps to sort out what my true feelings are. And then I can deal with those feelings. I don't have to react in behaviors that are unhealthy. I wish I could do that more often and uh, more consistently, but I'm reminded I'm human. This scriptural passage today directly confronts us with the subject of reconciliation. It requires spiritual thinking, no longer regarding people from a worldly point of view, according to the flesh, and certainly not regarding Christ from a worldly point of view, according to the flesh. The need for reconciliation arises because of our estrangement from God on account of our brokenness, our sinful natures, and our earthly transgressions, which manifests itself usually in two ways, in a failure to do what God commands and in a propensity to do what God forbids. We would be totally unable to escape these clutches except that the Lord stepped in. As we prepare to move through Holy Week, reliving the scriptural story together, we understand that the instrument of reconciliation is Christ Jesus, and that the cost of reconciliation is the death of our Lord Christ. The cross stands as a monument to the seriousness and dire consequences of sin. The method of reconciliation is the sacrifice of Christ as our representative and our substitute. He died as our representative, doing battle with the devil through his death and resurrection and coming out triumphant on each of our behalves. The result of reconciliation is a new and restored relationship with God. The old has passed away, and we are initiated into a new life in our Lord Jesus Christ. The new creation evidently has a cosmic dimension, but it is our privilege personally and individually to enter into its newness in the here and the now. Our severed relationship with God has been repaired and we find ourselves no longer slaves to sin, but have a new desire within our hearts to live for the one who has brought us back to life. Reconciliation requires a response from those who have offended. As an Eastern ambassador, Paul comes with bended knee, pleading, imploring on Christ's behalf for us to be reconciled to God. This is the Easter story. This is the gift that we receive when we do the work of cleaning house during Lent each season. Uh, that uh, we will sing is I Lay My Sins on Jesus, and it's on page 247 in our hymnal. And the tune is familiar to you. Um, so I just need to drink some water before I. I lay my sins on Jesus, the spotless Lamb of God. He bears them all and frees us 
from the accursed load. I bring my guilt to Jesus to wash my crimson stains. White in his blood most precious, till not a stain remains. I lay my wants on Jesus, all wholeness dwells in him. He heals all my diseases, he doth my soul redeem. I lay my griefs on Jesus, my burdens and my cares. He take from them all releases, he all my sorrows share. Okay, come on. Go. I rest my soul on Jesus, this weary soul of mine. His right hand me embraces, I on his breast recline. I love the name of Jesus, the man who wife my Lord. Like fragrance on the breezes, his name abroad is poured. I long to be like Jesus, meek, loving, lowly mind. I long to be like Jesus, the Father's holy child. I long to be with Jesus amid the heavenly throne, to sit with saints his praises, to learn the angel's song. And as we prepare to end our in your love, make us whole. May we rest in your compassion, calm the lost, weary soul. holy make us whole I truly hope that this Lenten season has been a time that has felt like healing and restoration regeneration and moving into reconciliation with those parts of you that might have felt uh, where you and God might be uh, severed or separated or estranged even. I thank each and every one for their participation this season. Um, I've gained a lot uh, and I hope that you have too. And so you may unmute yourselves and we can join in for discussion or visitation. Thank you.